Welcome listeners. I'm Miriam Merrill, Chair of the Physical Education Department and the Director of Pomona Pitzer Athletics. We are celebrating the 50th anniversary of Title IX, the landmark education amendment of 1972 that prohibits sex discrimination in any education program or activity receiving federal financial assistance. Pomona Pitzer is highlighting our own implementation of Title IX with a series of events and programs, including a four-part docu-series of conversations with various students, alumni, and coaches who played a pivotal role in the Title IX here on campus. I'm joined today by Ann Badges. From 1959 to 2003, Ann served Pomona College in many capacities, including a 25-year stint as a physical education uh, educator, coach, and administrator. Welcome, Ann. In college, Ann earned her B.S. at the University of Illinois in 1956. She taught for two years at Granite City High School in Southern Illinois. And then next, she ventured out west to complete her Master of Science in Physical Education at UCLA and worked there as a teaching assistant and instructor. Her next stop was at Pomona College. Anne worked tirelessly to create athletic opportunities for women over the next 25 years and teamed with her department members and colleagues across the country to work in support of the passage of Title IX. Anne assumed important leadership position as the chair of the Department of Physical Education and was also the first female to serve as the director of athletics. Whoop, whoop. Whoop, whoop, sorry. (laughs) It was through Anne's leadership that Pomona Pitzer Athletics navigated its way to the amazing athletic program available to Pomona and Pitzer female student athletes today. Anne also built an impressive women's tennis program, and that success lives on today. Anne coached the team from 1959 to 1984, and her teams won numerous team and individual titles. Anne left the Department of Physical Education in 1984 to assume the role of director of Oldenburg Center for Modern Languages and International Relations. Anne, we are so glad you're here to speak with us today. Thank you. Okay, well, I am so excited to have a conversation with you um, and want to start with the early years, if we can. So tell us about your youth. So where did you grow up? Were your family and friends physically active? Or did they watch or play sports? So what was the role of sports in your life? And tell us a little bit about your family. Uh, I was born in Galesburg, Illinois, which is in the western part of the state. My parents were immigrants my, from Greece. When my mother came, she was already uh, 19, I think, and she was a bit younger than my father, who was already here. He started in Chicago. Uh, we spoke Greek until I went to first grade. I had an older sister, so she helped out a lot on that. Younger brother and another younger sister. Um, my dad, of course, had the proverbial Greek restaurant. Everybody worked there. My mother didn't work there till we were in grade school. But uh, it was, uh, there were no other Greek families, and there were very few immigrants. And if they were, they were all Scandinavian, it seemed to me, because half the town had S-E-N or S-O-N at the back of their name, if you looked at the phone book. Uh, but it was a very active childhood because of the fact when both my parents were working, we were sort of free to run around, because my mother was very strict in a way, but she lost a little control when she was at work all the time, so. But we all started working in the restaurant from the day we could handle it. Awesome, so it sounds like you spent a lot of time working in the restaurant and not too much time for sports or play? We didn't have sports then. The only sports that were available to women were softball and YMCA basketball. And we didn't belong to the Y. And there was no YW, I think, at the time. It was just a YMCA. There was, there was a program for women to play uh, basketball, but uh, it was out of my realm. But I did get to play softball because I met my, uh, one of the uh, physical education teachers from, uh, got me into the softball. And I did play uh, in a league that went all the way down through Iowa and uh, parts of Illinois and over to Peoria, had one really good person on the team, and she finally went to a bigger team, and the Pekin Letts, who were the national champions at one point. Wow. Always played Orange County or Orange, whatever they call themselves here. So I did have that as a role model uh, for sports, but that was it as far as uh, sure. high school. It was just PE classes and W, well, it was GAA, Girls Athletic Association. We did a little bit of everything. Yeah, and so I'm going to ask a, a quick question. You know, now... 
girls participating. It's just normal to see lots of girls playing yeah. sports. So was, you know, the team that you traveled yeah. and played with, were they smaller teams? Yeah. Were they larger? Well, they weren't teams. They're, the only one I know of is the softball team. And they were primarily married women and some of the unmarried women in town. Sure. That didn't have an opportunity, and it was one thing open to them. They had bowling leagues. I did remember I became a good bowler, mm-hmm. uh, as a matter of fact. And at Pomona College later, I had the men's champion bowling team. Wow. I was sort of their accompaniment. I didn't know a lot about bowling, but those guys knew a lot more than I did. But we won. We came second in the nation. Wow. Or maybe we came in first. I don't even remember. That's awesome. Isn't that awesome? But it's in the trophy room. Awesome. So, uh, well, I want to talk a little bit about kind of your, your choice to major in physical education. So what made you decide to major in physical education? Were you prepared to be a teacher and a coach? And well, No, it was just sort of a last-minute kind of deal. I didn't know what I really wanted to do. Um, but I did have some wonderful physical education teachers in, in high school. And when I finally decided at the last minute to go to Illinois instead of Iowa, because my sister was in a nursing program in Iowa, uh, I just fell into that because it just seemed like the easiest thing to do. But I was still doing music and doing a lot of things. I couldn't quite decide, but I did start in on the program. And by the end of it, you know, or I got partway into it, then you're sort of hooked. But I I will say in those days, you didn't have time to follow all your other pursuits because the programs then just took forever. For one credit, you went like 10 hours of class. It was just insane. So you were always on the fields learning all these sports, but uh, it, there wasn't a big sport program. It was WAA then, Women's Athletic Association, and they had short little periods of this and that. Sure. So what opportunities did women have to play in the WAA? Is well, it just any, some of anybody those smaller... could come, yeah. But, you know, if, you had, if there was a coach, mm-hmm. then you did it. We, it. Had a, we had field hockey. Sure. We had soccer. Uh I don't think we had bowling. I can't remember that. Illinois, we had uh, swimming, mm-hmm. uh, aquacade. Uh, I say that because I had to teach synchronized swimming and aquacade when I came here. Okay, you have to tell us more about aquacade. Uh, well, uh, synchronized swimming, everybody knows from watching the Olympics now. Uh, it's a terrifically hard sport. When sure. I came... Uh, the second year that I was here, the woman that had been doing the synchronized swimming was uh, fairly internationally known, and I didn't know Bumpkus. So there was the woman's best synchronized swimmer in the world was in Glendale, and the other one was out at Riverside. So every, every Thursday night, I drove on Route 66 to Glendale YMCA and took synchronized swimming classes and courses and and learned a lot about I never could do it really well but I learned how it yeah was supposed to be and how hard it really was and then we did uh, seven years of aquacades uh, big shows went into Hollywood hired Klieg lights the whole nine yards in that little teeny pool that Pomona College had memorial pool sure that's awesome mm-hmm so let's, you know, we talked a little bit about the Midwest. Let's go ahead and bring it to the West Coast. So how did it happen that you came all the way out to California to attend UCLA and pursue your master's degree? Well, I was teaching, uh, as I said, in the high school level. And it just so happened my senior year at Illinois, we had the national convention in Chicago. And they had a student group to head up the student uh, sections of the nationals. And I met many famous people there, men and women, but particularly the women, because we had them come and speak to the student section, which was, uh, they were uh, Eleanor Matheny from SC and Ruth Abernathy from UCLA. And I'm not sure if Rosalind Cassidy was there at the time, but it was a student session, but it was flooded out by the regulars who came instead of the poor students. And as a matter of fact, that little committee also started the search programs, which has now become big time. But it was eventually for students coming out of colleges, and then it became anyone looking for a job. But that was quite interesting. But that's how I met Abernathy. And one day I went to a conference, in national conference in Kansas City, and I mentioned that I might like to. And she said, well, give me a three-by-five thumbnail sketch. And... Uh, I handed it to her, and the next thing you know, 
I'm on my way to UCLA. Wow. Wow. Without so, having taken any grad record exam, what I had to do when I got there. Poo poo. Sure. Yeah. So what was your work like as a teaching assistant at UCLA? Uh, you were teaching everything you didn't know anything about. First thing I had was tennis classes, which I, at, you know, introductory level I could teach. Uh, archery I could teach. I had some archery classes. Swimming, I could do that, and I had that. And I loved the fear sections, people that didn't know how to swim. It, and those kids usually came from uh, foreign countries, first chance to get into a pool. Um, I, and the bow, I did. I already mentioned bowling. I, can't, I think that's all I was mm -hmm. teaching at the, the university. That's great. So, But I did have an opportunity to learn tennis from a wonderful gal who happens to be the aunt of mm -hmm. Jim... A uh, courier who happened to be a U USTA champion. Wow. He's still on the on the new. I mean, broadcasting from Wimbledon and all those places. So that's great. Yes, run into a lot of good teachers. Mm -hmm. Sounds like it. So in 1959, shortly after you finished at UCLA, you accepted a job here at Pomona College. This is probably one of my favorite stories to hear. So I'm I'm going to ask this question selfishly so I can hear it again. Tell us about the transition from UCLA to, to coming to Pomona College. Well, I was sitting in the TA office with all the TAs, both the PhD candidates <coughs> and uh, MS candidates and MA candidates, and the head of the department came walking in because she knew somebody that graduated from Pomona College who taught at Pomona, a fellow named Snyder, in the, phys in the history, phys physical education history, and he said there was a job opening for one year. Nobody shook their head. So she came in a second time, and she says, Ann, wouldn't you just like this for one year? And she says, and you could reflect on what you're doing on your thesis. And so we finally flipped a coin. Heads I come, tails I don't. It was heads. So I got in my little car on a hot, smoggy July day. No, no freeway from UCLA to Hollywood freeway. Got in my car took me forever to get to Pomona College. And the same apocryphal story, you didn't know there were mountains there. So I got to the Renwick Gymnasium, found it, and here it was all blue with smoke because the department chair smoked. Everybody smoked in those days. So, and it was hot, and I couldn't believe the building. And she says, well, we're going downtown for the interview. We went to Walters, which was already there, not as big as it is now, but it was air conditioned. So I, it took me a while, and I finally said, yeah, I'd come out for the year. And then somebody left the next year, and that person, first year I didn't do tennis because that per, the tennis person was back. The next year, uh, so I, I'd had to do tennis. The next year, the, the synchronized swimming person left and the swimming coach left, so then I had to put that under my wing too. And all the other sports, because we were just in a small conference. You know, we didn't do anything. The only thing big was tennis, and we went to Ojai. And the tennis was huge. And as, uh, as mentioned other places that we know, Darlene Hard was there for the first year or had left, but she came back and got me started on my tennis career and introduced me to a young Billie Jean King in Long Beach at 14 or 16, Billie was, and I'm still her friend, which is very nice, still in contact. That's great. Who would have thought 44 years, like one year would have turned into 44 years? Who would have thought? Right. Every year I was ready to step out. And I did retire on the younger side. I didn't wait till I was in my 80s and 90s <laughs> or even my 70s <laughs> before I took a walk. Uh, yeah. So it led to many careers, all of them which started out as one year at a time, including Oldenburg Center, which was 18 years, including women's studies, I took over for somebody that didn't want to do it right at the beginning, and that was three years. Sure. Uh, and that was uh, that was a really a wonderful gig, as they say. Yeah. Learned a lot. You just step, keep one step ahead of everybody, and I mean just literally one step. Mm -hmm. And you're just studying as hard as you can and going to the people that know more than you do. Sure. Which is an important thing, and people forget to do that. Mm -hmm. That's sometimes you feel you're on your knees begging, but please. <laughs> yes. So when did you get involved with Title IX in the efforts to increase uh, sport opportunities for women? 
in the seventies, I think. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. When, uh, what were some of the first things you did to try to get involved? We had lots of meetings. We had a wonderful group, including some of the top people: Judy Holland from UCLA. Uh, uh, I just forgot the name of the one from USC. She went on Barbara Hedges. She went on to US to University of Washington. Um, wonderful one, Joan Johnson from Cal State LA. Another one up at the. Uh, the Valley, San Fernando. We called it San Fernando Valley. Then. And Cal State Long Beach, some wonderful women. And we just started working in that direction and having meetings. And meeting in Denver, meeting in a lot of different places, Arizona. I can't remember them all. And I, uh, I remember being parliamentarian for a few of those, which was way beyond my pay grade, mm-hmm. be parliamentarian. But uh, So it was... A lot of give and take in the beginning, trying to decide on where to stay. And we all were AIAW in those days. And it finally, the big schools finally pulled away because it became too difficult not to go to NC2A. Mm -hmm. And uh, then Nancy and Nettie, Nancy uh, Breitenstein and Nettie Morrison were two of the terrific coaches at Pomona College. And... They also sort of bent the way of NC2A. They saw more opportunities going that way than staying in the smaller leagues. Yeah, let's talk about that for a second. I think, um, you know, most folks just know the AIAW existed and then the NCAA happened. Like, what was that transition Well, before like AIAW, there was even the ECC, SEC, SEC. There were all sure. these other smaller ones. Yeah. And then uh, we, we formed leagues around like colleges, but we were playing in the same league as UCLA and SC and tennis and basketball and volleyball. So finally, they started getting coaches that were specifically for just one thing and didn't do anything else. So it was obvious that they were going to get way ahead of us in the game. And that's when we all started looking at divisions. And then it became natural. Well, it wasn't natural. It was a fight. And there were some people that stayed till the end, like Donna Lopiano at Texas. Oh, my goodness. She stayed with AIAW till she died, I yeah. think. Oh, man, she's yeah. probably still alive. Yes. I shouldn't yes. say yes. that. Yes. I have no clue. But uh, so there were some very interesting national debates on that. And we went over. And I think for me, it was Nancy and Eddie that pushed me into. I sort of held the line, too, for a while. Yeah. It was a big and and the NC two A uh, to me too felt like a takeover. Sure, I bet. I felt you were going to be swallowed up by the big guy. Yeah, and so you were able to hold out for as long as you could, and then thought, hey, for the better betterment of the programs, yeah, and, yeah. and then we divided up into uh, divisions according to the men's program, so that the women at uh, UCLA and SC could give scholarships, then. and the women in Division two half and half, and Division three, as you know, no, sir. Yeah. And so what do you think would have been the best decision? Would it have been for AIAW to, ex- to continue to exist uh, alongside NCAA? Or what, what I do you think? think that would have been difficult because there was no money. Sure, sure. You couldn't give somebody a entitlement, but if, if you don't have support from the universities and, mm-hmm. um, and of course, you, you saw the big schools raise money through their football program sure. primarily and basketball, and it supported everyone. And as we talked earlier, now recently, UCLA and SC are pulling out of the Pac-10. What are the rest of the schools going to do? And is there going to be any money left over for women's programs at all at these other ones? Yeah. Are the universities going to support those programs if they don't have income? Those are all it's great gonna, questions. It's a new day. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about that new day, right? Especially since because you've seen you know, what athletic participation looked like before and then kind of now where we are. So if you were to kind of take a look at – uh, the strides that we've made with gender equity and support for women in, in sports after Title IX, uh, what are your thoughts, right? Did Pomona have uh, an organized plan to achieve gender equity in the athletic program and then just in general? Um, I think we finally strides? did. I think we finally did. I think, uh, as I mentioned, Nancy Breitenstein and Eddie Morrison were really uh, spearheads of that, and I hoped I was an enabler for that also because I believed in it. Um, and we finally, they particularly, pushed themselves into the men's gym. Uh, before that, if you wanted to do anything, it was 6 o'clock in the morning were your practices. So they started trading off the times 
for the women's basketball program and finally the volleyball program. Uh, it took a long while, though, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. until the facilities, and it was still a fight. <laughs> sure. But you, know, you had to be vigilant the whole time or you would lose it. And it wasn't because they didn't want us in the gym. They needed the time, too, for practice. Everybody wanted their teams to practice at the best times mm-hmm. for the student athlete. Yeah. It couldn't be coming all hours of the day to practice. Right. So you stayed really busy throughout the years. You've advanced through the faculty ranks. You coached numerous sports, taught classes, held leadership roles, such as the department chair and the director of athletics. How did you manage to get everything done? It was, I don't know myself. I was thinking about that the other day because not only, uh, the first semester I was teaching 13 different classes. I remember that. And I thought, what am I doing? It was just amazing. And then when I became chair, It was the demand of students that wanted all these new courses that we didn't have any money in our budget to get, starting with all the martial arts and every kind of course you ever dreamed of that you didn't even know existed that they wanted. And so consequently, uh, you developed a program in which you hired somebody from the outside. I don't know if you can do that. And we charged the students, which was a no-no at the beginning. But the the students wanted to do it, so we would have these classes in the martial arts and different dance kinds of movements and whatever. Mm -hmm. But we managed to get some really good people that worked for next to nothing, like Dr. Francis Zold, who was the Olympian Hungarian fencer and coach. Oh, wow. He was was escaped hungry, so he taught for practically nothing. We had the world-class fencer instructor in the world, fencing instructor in the world at Pomona College, and Caltech we shared. Oh, wow. It was really kind of amazing. Yeah. So we got lucky on a lot of things like that. That's great. Uh, you know, one of the questions that I, I like to ask in my interview is about Renwick Gym, right? I've Ooh. never seen it. Most of our listeners haven't. What are your memories of Renwick? What do you want to share and make sure that we know and remember about that gym? Well, I told you my first visit coming on a Friday afternoon and all it was was smoke holes the light was coming through the holes had been put there by the woodpeckers bees on the floor because they also stored honey there uh the bees stored honey in the sides of that and would fall on the floor every once in a while and sting especially the dancers who were butts on the floor (laughs) uh that's my first memory that first day Mm-hmm. But as I told everybody that there's that wonderful film out, and I just forgot the name. Do you remember the name I gave you? Uh, of course not, but I do remember you telling me. We will make sure that we uh, Get post it, in it somewhere, yes. Because it gives you Renwick Gym in a nutshell, and it even makes it a little better than what it was, really, yes. because they painted the floor for it. But it was a wonderful first-class movie, actually. That's great. Well, you've certainly done a lot. Is there anything in particular that is like your greatest accomplishment or the one kind of memory that sticks out for you? I don't know. That's asking a lot from somebody who's Mm -hmm. done a lot. Uh, There were so many highlights. So at the time that I was at Pomona, it's very hard to just choose one. But there is one that stands in my mind, and that's Penny Dean, our famous marathon swimmer that held the English Channel swim record for ages. But at one point, when she was an undergraduate, we went down to... The peninsula, and she took off in the water at 10 o'clock at night, and she swam to Catalina. And I could, I can't get that out of my mind, this little tiny person getting in that dark Pacific and swimming all the way to Catalina Island at night with a little rowboat by her side. That was one of my highlights. Yeah, that sounds like it. 10 p.m.? Oh, my yeah, goodness. Well, yes. that you had scary. to catch the current at the right time. Oh, wow. And, and it was a very rocky place, the very tip of the peninsula, Pacific Palisades or whatever. It was. No, that's up north, but it was something like that. And then safety-wise, I mean, you all, I'm sure, had your safety plan and whatnot. I would probably not sleep the night before. <laughs> well, if I would scared. penny, but uh, yeah. you know, she was already a swimmer of sure. note. She swam San Francisco Bay and around Alcatraz and all that nonsense. Wow. And, and then eventually did the English Channel. Wow. That's great. As you know, Pomona College is a special place, although most people think their alma mater is a special place. Neither uh, UCLA and U U of I uh, hold the memory that Pomona does because I was here a lot longer 
than I was at those two institutions, though I love them both dearly for what they gave me. Um, I would say my University of Illinois professors were the ones that got me started. They were amazing, and I kept track of them until they died, which is really another wonderful thing. Um, and a few from UCLA that way, but mostly it was UC it was uh, from Illinois. That's great. And a few of my high school teachers that got me even thinking in that direction, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because I was a fairly good athlete. Yeah. Not a wonderful one, just fairly good at a million things. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, that's the as, trick. As was the thing then, because, well. That's another story. There's a lot of stories out there. But yes. We have a limited time. And I could listen to all of them. Another time over coffee. Yes, absolutely. Um, so here's the, the last question that I'll ask. Um, is there anything else that you would like to share with our current student athletes or anything you want to make sure that they know about either your experience or? No, uh, I would just say that you just have to love what you're doing, even through the bad days when you don't want to do it. Uh, remember why you came in the first place to the selections you made, even college, uh, avocation, sports, music, whatever. Just remember just to get up every day and enjoy it. It goes by fast. Yeah, those are great words of advice. So thank you very much, Anne, for joining us today. You're welcome. We are so grateful for your time and grateful to you for all your work that you have done to create opportunities for our current student athletes and myself. So thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, listeners, for tuning in today. Please look for our other programs and events celebrating Pomona Pitzer's 50 years of Title IX. We'll see you soon.